Or um, to do this, although I see that hasn't stopped you from having lunch, which is <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, my husband and I collected clothing, historic or period clothing, um, for many years, and it ended up at the Genesee Country Village. So go see it sometime. They have two of, of their galleries dedicated to that, so it's always on view with lots of drawers to pull out full of stuff, like at Williamsburg. And along the way, early on, uh, we were given a family heritage quilt that had lots of interesting cloth bits in it and I wondered if one could date the quilt from the fabric and here I am. Um, this is a two-hander. This is the one that came out in January, wearable print 1760 to 1860, published by Kent State University Press. It started out as my thesis, which got out of hand fast. and represents many years of, of research and hair pulling and screaming and ranting. Um, but it's uh, now a Bible for those of us interested in this topic. And what I'm showing today is not a, a 20 minute rehash of what's in this thing, but what they made me leave out. Uh, what they made me leave out was as I was progressing with the research, I was urged to include, you know, what is calico, what do they mean, what, who, where was cotton from, how is it play, played out in history, and I wasn't going to totally ignore any historical aspects because that's, I'm not a trained historian, but I ended up getting pulled into the vortex, and the part of the vortex that I had to leave out was how it, calico, printed calicos, played into the lives of the sturdy pioneer. So, this is entitled Calico and the Sturdy Pioneer. Uh, some of you may be familiar with um, Von Wagenen's um, The Golden Age of Homespun, and uh, I'm, I'm here to shoot that down. <coughs> <laughs> what does pioneer make you think of? Pioneers had hard lives, providing all their own minimal needs, far from the convenience and comforts of civilization. They were poor but sturdy folk. Hmm. Here's a fine modern family as described around 1854. Uh, as a costume historian, I can tell you, uh, first of all, they're dressed way too old-fashioned for 1854, and second, in my comings and goings, this is a woodcut put in a, a school book uh, <clears throat> that was used in 1854 by a local family here, and this appears in earlier forms where the father is wearing breeches properly, not trousers, which is older, and so on. Uh, Note that the little boys are reading because they're going to be educated. The girl is not because she's not. She's getting ready to spin some linen there by the fire so they can have a fire from the lint that's kicked off from the linen spinning, but that's all right. And everybody's very happy. What's wrong with this picture? The Industrial Revolution. People were concerned about the loss as we are today, loss of values that we um, believe belong in the family. We're worried about family values being torn asunder by changes in society. So this was not in the earlier editions of this, this school book. It was in the mid 19th century version because by this time the family was not sitting around the fireside and the young sister was not spinning and they were not all nuclear. So this was a sort of desperate attempt to, to pull the family concepts and values back together again. An 1850s rendition of a young woman would look more like this, not like what you just saw. Here she's lost in thought and, and pondering her future, uh, something that an earl, her mother or grandmother was not likely to be doing because they were too busy spinning and weaving and washing the dishes and so forth and so on. This is more typical of an 1850s interior. While it represents an earlier, like late 18th century home with generations of furniture present up to about 1860, 
the, char the characteristic they would most all have had in common is that center table with the center lamp around which the family would have gathered in the 1850s to read, to sew, and to chat before they turned in. In 1890s, Allegheny County historian said, few indeed were the early homes into which the cards, the spinning wheel, the flag wheel, the quill wheel, the swifts, the warping bars, and the loom did not find early entrance, so we know every woman was busy weaving. Another one speaking of 1850s Western New York in 1976, and this was Helene Phelan, who most of you have heard of, said, oddly enough, at the beginning of her book, um, if there is no spinning, there is no yarn. If there is no yarn, there were no clothes. And she was speaking of Mariah Whitford's time in the 1850s. And yet later in the book, she sees all this activity I'm going to allude to, which shows you that Mariah is not wearing homespun. So now we have this everywhere. Um, never mind what's wrong with this picture, but the general impression being given is this is what an oldie tiny person did out on the edge of a frontier somewhere. This is an elaborate structure of a, a linen towel or tablecloth. And in the 18th, 17th centuries, 18th century, most of the newcomers, particularly to the New England area, uh, a, a weaver was a man, and he was doing it as his, his livelihood. This was not a lady's f fun project to do in her spare time. Over time, the New England weavers moved on to farming or other more lucrative occupations. Some of them, some of the women, eventually put the loom back into operation for their own purposes. And they were not as educated as those men professional weavers were. As they were the ones who became the icons of homespun, we will be looking at what those women did. This is a Wallace Nutting photograph, a representation of olden times. The woman is standing, not seated, at a little teeny loom, and it's actually about a 1910 do-it-yourself rug loom. It has nothing to do with the period, and moreover, she's got it right in front of the door. No one's going to be able to get around her. But he was a passionate, uh, let's say, purveyor of traditional New England pilgrimy colonial history and he did it not only as some of you know probably through his reproduced colonial period furniture but through a zillion photographs that hung on many walls and, and told the story of history for many people. This was the kind of accepted view for the early 20th century. Here's one of those, that type of funny rug and um, this is what we're stuck with today, that image of what colonial stuff is. So what does calico make you think of? this. These are what quilt shops call calico nowadays. In the 17th and 18th centuries, euros called all cotton cloths, even white ones, calicos. And in fact, in Britain, they still will use that term calico to mean just any cotton cloth. These novel cloths, which and it was to them in that time, came from India. The ones with colored patterns were called chits by the natives, meaning spotted. The term was used loosely by English traders to refer to both painted and printed ones. But in common use, chits became a singular noun and evolved into chins to denote a cloth pattern with several colors. And of course, by today, we have an even different meaning or more specific meaning for it. And you may have heard a docent say somewhere, only the wealthy, which by inference is the urban, could afford printed cottons. Not so. As a matter of fact, this is a banyan or a robe kind of construction, much reworked, beat up, patched, heavily used, so it saw a long, long, long period of use, and it was a very cheap printed India cotton, um, block printed, and a rare survivor, rare because the people collecting period cloths in the early 20th century were interested in this beautiful stuff. This was hand-painted cloth. Now the sample here is from a palampour or quilt type border, but it's the same quality, same technique used on the dress that you see. Uh, those were the expensive things and those were what rich people used or wore. 
Brits or the Europeans figured out ways to make their own printing costs. That's a whole story in itself. This is a copper plate example, and this sample here is obviously a different color, but that's a close-up of a copper plate printed fabric. So the Europeans were getting into the act <coughs> as well as they could, but there was cheap stuff out there. In fact, the copper plates were meant to be cheap. Cheap prints for all in the mid-18th century, quote, the very weavers and sellers of calico will acknowledge that all the mean people, the maid servant, and indifferently poor persons who would otherwise clothe themselves and were usually clothed in thin woman's woolens are now clothed in calico or printed linen. Moved to it as well for the cheapness as the lightness of the cloth and the gaiety of the colors. The children universally, whose frocks and coats were all either made of tammies or of stripped, striped thin woolens, appear now in printed calicos or printed linen. Let anyone but cast their eyes among the meaner sort playing in the street or of the better sort at boarding school. Everybody wore it. This is in the collection at the Smithsonian. It's a very early print from England and probably cut down from mom's dress for this little child. It has two colors, three colors really, red, pink, and black, and the difficulty in controlling the Morton, which maybe you can see how blurry the red and, blue, red and pink look, was a sign <coughs> of how early a print this was. The European printers were emulating Indian patterns, but they still hadn't figured out how to make the Mordens behave neatly on the cloth. Scraps from the records of the London Foundling Hospital, circa 1755, is published in Threads of Feeling, which was an exhibit that traveled around several places. These were tokens left by moms who left their infants on the doorstep. These were meant to be a way of identifying the infant that came, like you give them a piece of the cloth and you retain a piece of the cloth if you want to come back and reclaim this infant when you're ready to take care of it again. You can match up. But these are the ones left on record and they give you an example of cheap prints of the day. This was not true just in England. Quote, various kinds of finished cloth make up over half of all the manufactured goods transported to the American mainland during the 18th century, notes one historian. That's over half of what in England exported to us, which was gobs, was cloth. A colonial observer confirmed this abundance of imported cloth in 1753, resignedly commenting that our beds, our tables, and our bodies are covered with it. 21 years later, Governor Tryon of New York reported that more than 11 twelfths of the inhabitants of this province, both in the necessary and ornamental parts of their dress, are clothed in British manufactures. He went on to acknowledge that there was little available in Britain that was not available in New York. So much for us not having stuff. It was intended that we have English stuff. We were meant to be their customers, not to mention suppliers of raw materials. And in, these are our garments in the Cup Museum of Costume in Bath, England. As one industrial leader, Parsley Peel, as his nickname was, commented to the meeting of Manchester calico printers as early as 1786, three parts of four of printed goods are consumed by the lowest class of people. This was not a high-end item, and that's where the money was to be made. And those lowest class of people are here because there are ins and outs, but by and large in England and Europe, uh, France anyway, we'll talk about, um, they were forbidden because it was a threat to their local wool and silk industries and linen to some extent. So uh, printed cottons were banned. And the, the Brits were smart because they allowed their printers to make it, but they had to export it. And this is where it landed. And this is another one that's a kind of a, a very cheap and dirty kind of a design, but the background being dark as it is, probably intended to be black, would have been um, expensive for the amount of dye it required. But here's a cheap one, a lattice pattern made by a block, wood block carved to have just di diagonal lines going one way. It was used in a short gown, as they were called, or bed gown. And you can see from the salvage here that when the block was rotated 90 degrees to do the, the lattice in the other direction, you ended up with the two directions of line and that would have looked trendy to the beholder because 
everyone was accustomed to vertical and horizontal orientations from weaving structure. So this is one way of denying that vertical and horizontal structure that the cloth has inherently and going at it 90 degrees off or 45 I guess you could say and uh, probably though it was cheap would have looked trendy to the wearer and would have made her happy. This has the three blue threads in the selvage which had to be incorporated if the manufacturers wished to not have to pay taxes on it. It was being shipped over here. That was between 1785 and 18, or 4 and 1811. Okay, every female spun and wove? No. 80% of the printed calico output was sold for under 2 shillings 6 pence a yard and 11% sold for 1 shilling or under. Fabrics in this price range might be printed with up to five colors. The lower class of people were indeed enjoying the fruits of industrialization, and that's from 1797. So they knew full well what they were doing. They're, they're selling to a low-end market <coughs> and getting rich. At Cornell, there's this little infant dress that at first I thought was a, a copper plate print because of its delicacy, but after a long time studying it and looking for glitches, I can tell you it's a woodblock printed dress. It would have been very cheap and dirty kind of print, accomplished not by carving, but by hammering pins or little bars of copper into the block to make that pattern. It was a truly quick way to get the effect. It would have been very cheap. Here's a, a similar one, a, a nicer print, a dress of about 1800 at the Smithsonian. This one has flowers. And you can see traces of pink and probably green, so it had additional colors added to it. But it's, again, a very simple and, and not requiring a heck of a lot of dye, so it would have been a pretty cheap fabric. Um, here's a similar dress, just two colors, very simple pattern. You don't get to see these early prints very often, so if you care, take a good look. And these are um, two colors also, a little bit more complicated than the one above, but still pretty cheap, quick and dirty a good everyday affordable dress. At um, the Bolton Museum in England, um, Manchester, not Manchester, Bolton, um, are the Peel. Peel was a family of print works manufacturers. This is some, some of their output samples. You can see how they love color. You can see the different ways they went about it. You, you um, can get some idea of how people might have looked coming and going on the sidewalk or on the roads, uh, assuming all of these patterns sold. But most, most of it at that time was probably ending up over here. This is a dress, again, at the Smithsonian that's indigo blue over dyed with yellow. And one in my collection at this moment, um, which is a hard one to figure out, but I've also determined that it probably has Prussian blue, blue worked into it as well, which is a new mineral color coming into use at that time that would shortcut the indigo process and make it cheaper. Here's another short gown, dark brown, kind of crummy looking print, but it did the job. It has the three blue threads in the selvage. Here's a little boy's trousers, again, another early fabric serviceable. The Workwoman's Guide was published in 1838 but probably based on earlier practices and thoughts and it says infants frocks are generally made of jaconet muslin which is a thin fine muslin you might think of as cambric today and print. Those for the poor are usually of print so those nice white baby gowns that you may know of are the good stuff. This is what Joe Baby wore. And this is in rough shape. I had to do a lot of conservation on that just so it would hold together. It's a survivor. It wasn't uh, the sort of thing that people thought was precious and saved, like those pretty white ones. It's about 1820. Those commonly worn by servants and the working classes are of print. These are two servants. Uh, in a very high-end Scottish household depicted by an uh, ambitious child who liked to paint. And they're probably wearing fabrics much like what you see down here, which are a thin cotton with colorful wild patterns on it, heavy stripes. And uh, linen stuff, which is a form of wool. And for best, light ginghams. Ginghams in those days could be just stripes, not checks as we assume it has to be now. And the sample on the right shows three swatches that a woman saved from her 
trousseau. Her blue indigo dress was 25 cents a yard. Her gingham dress was 42 cents a yard, 25 and 42. So you can see her gingham was a nicer dress than her printed cal calico. Pioneering in Western New York. Now, some of you may be familiar with this. Here he is. He's just chopped down a huge tree. He's got his stock feeding on whatever they can find. He's just begun a clearing, and uh, the log cabin has been built, but there's not much else to work with yet. A little later, they've got fences. The croplands are being expanded. There's still a lot of stumps to be burning out of there, and they've still got some piglets born and, and things are looking good and here we are a little later they've got roads and bridges and mills and nice fences and orchard and more crops and so forth barns and finally we have the wonderful stylish house and croplands and meadows as far as the eye can see and a nice stone bridge okay in Rochester which was founded around 1810 Here's Rochester in 1812, according to the artist. And DeWitt Clinton is saying to his friend, when I saw your place in 1810 without a house, who would have thought that in 1826 it would be the scene of such a change? And he was talking about this. This is a house in Rochester area of about that date. So from, from stumps to this, didn't take them very long. Uh, pioneers did not go through all that to be downwardly mobile. Shopping was good in Rochester, too. The papers advertised all kinds of things, stylish caps, millinery, and so forth. The women were out there with the men. It wasn't just the guys in their coonskin caps. Ready-made clothing was offered because guys coming out on their own didn't have somebody to make clothing for them necessarily. Country merchants were invited to come and stock up. Uh, you could get your fake curls up in Rochester, too, because you, of course, wanted to be fashionable like anybody else back home. Country merchants had ready access to goods brought from fashion centers, stuff like this. And notice that in this case, sheeting is even offered because not everybody's weaving their own sheets. Now, this is 1856, the steamship Arabia, which some of you may be aware of, sank and was at great length and pain and expense excavated by a private family and supporters. Uh, and it's in a museum now in Mississippi, but it went down with all of its cargo. And what do we have here heading out to the very fringes of civilization? China doorknobs. Every pioneer needs China doorknobs, don't they? They need to have a pitcher and wash basin for washing their hands. That looks pretty. They need nice china and tea wares on their table, don't they? And the ladies must have their crystal and gold jewelry, don't they? And of course, uh, they have to always be weaving everything they wear because they've been spinning too. No, they've got bolts of cloth, they've got ready to wear clothes, and they've got even mittens knitted ready to buy too. Which isn't to say this was a universal thing, but the guy that, the people that loaded all that cargo onto that ship had full expectation of making money selling this stuff to the people that went out to the edge of the planet and didn't want to leave it all behind and didn't intend to. Frontier prints for children. This is in the Ontario County Historical Society, probably cut down from a mom dress, but it has a fashionable train. It's a very fashionable cut for about 1800. And this is a child not romping in homespun. And this is, an, an, this is another one in Angelica in the Free Library that uh, uh, the hottest thing in prints, rainbow print, in the latest style of about 1820. And this is a little bit later in a, get in a very nice, very fancy print and even has matching pantalettes. Big deal, big deal. This was purchased, we purchased this from a dealer who got it at a yard sale in Rochester. Ouch. In Marilla, in their historical society, they have this. The little boy who wore this was living in the wild woods of the Black Mountain in remote of remotest places in New Hampshire. They had access to cloth. When he was old enough, he brought his family out to western New York, and this little suit had been saved and was brought along. So now it's at the Marilla Historical Society. Printed cotton out in the middle of nowhere. Let's take a look at pioneer choices in Allegheny County, New York. And we all recognize the gray skies and the pretty hills. 
like that. Menard wrote, to say that the early settlers of Allegheny County were poor is putting the facts mildly. Many were of New England stock, intelligent, industrious, and possessed of those qualities of character which always overcome opposition and win success. No county in the state was regarded so unfavorable and uninviting as this one we today call our own. Well do I remember when my father and mother bade goodbye to their well-to-do friends in Livingston County where plenty abounded and took their four children and came up into poor Allegheny to build up a home where only $400 was required to buy a farm. And it's still one of the poorest areas in the state. Nevertheless, some good stuff was available from the start. The first landowner and settler in 1801 was Philip Schuyler Church, seen here with his mother, Angelica Schuyler Church, Jet Set. His uncle and lawyer mentor in time was Alexander Hamilton, no less. These families knew how to live well. When Philip came to the Allegheny Woods to see what could be done with the place, it was not long before he built himself a stylish home. And he enjoyed being the flea-bitten woodsman, but he still had silk suits for the right occasions. He wasted little time setting up a store of sorts to provide goods to incoming settlers and their wives who intended to maintain standards amid the mud and stumps. This is not homespun. This is the stuff they could get. Here's a list of some of the things. An umbrella, fans, Morocco shoes, suspenders, gilt vest buttons, a bandana and mattress handkerchief, chip bonnets, silk ribbons, lace, skeins of silk and crooked combs, calico ranging from 30 cents to 81 cents a yard, India cotton, shirting muslin, cambric, fine linen, jaconet muslin, brown linen, brown holland, calamanco, India muslin, the expensive stuff, russellette, raving duck, velvet, striped linen, oil cloth, mixed cloth, muslinette, flannel, broadcloth, casimir, dowlas, durant, Irish linen, check linen, dimity, nanking, scarlet cloth, silk and tow, and the list goes on. Uh, if you wanted it, you could have it. Uh, maybe not gobs of it was sold, but it was out here in the mud and the stumps. Note that the store sold cloth of the sort that could have been woven at home, and examples found today might be assumed to have been so produced. Brown linen, brown holland, which was a coarse linen, checked linen, striped linen, toe, calamanco, and flannel were all things that you will hear of women having woven or, or what they produced would look like what you're seeing here, kind of coarse and rather clunky. However, in Rhode Island, uh, the textile industry was just kicking in, and they were just beginning to have power looms. Uh, these are samples from a Rhode Island manufactory of checked cotton cloth that if you saw it lying around somewhere unidentified, you'd say, oh, look at the homespun. Uh, I have seen somebody uh, offer a circa 1920 uh, child's romper suit that che was checked as homespun. <clears throat> but I ironically, this stuff would have been woven by a woman at her home loom because un up until this time the power looms could not do the cross stripes so if you wanted to have actual checks that has to still be done on a hand powered loom so those women who had uh, taken up weaving as a sport let's say uh, were called upon to answer the need of these mill owners who wanted to produce check cloth with the gazillion miles of cotton yarn they had just begun producing. So uh, we see that basic cloth for clothing could be purchased even in a remote setting because this stuff was sold all over and it also could be imported from Europe long before that. Homespun was not everyone's fate. This is another short gown and never mind, trust me, it's homespun and homewoven. Why wouldn't women weave their own cloth? A loom and its equipment were capital investment. Weaving required dedicated workspace. Weaving required a good supply of raw materials, and it was labor intensive, taking the weaver away from necessary household tasks. Why would a woman weave cloth? Well, um, to be absolutely self sufficient. Because cotton cloth was not affordable, this is like a multiple choice question. Make your pick. To demonstrate patriotic sentiment, to have discretionary income, for the love of threads. Okay, absolutely self-sufficient. Forget that. Pioneers could not be absolutely self-sufficient. They shared stuff around. They had to help each other. And they bought stuff. Cotton cloth was not affordable. By now you know that's not true. 
to demonstrate patri patriotic sentiment. Yes, during the, the Revolutionary War period and later the Civil War period, they got fired up about not importing anybody's goods. They make it themselves. And I have a nice quote of a young woman who's just graduated from college, but she's being congratulated for the beautiful cloth she spun and wove herself. She did not need to spin and weave her own cloth if she just graduated from college. She is making a point. To have discretionary income, you bet. For the love of threads, you're looking at one who's nuts enough to try to weave, even though it's absolutely unnecessary. <clears throat> There's still a lot of us around. Let's see what three weavers and Alfred did. Mary Woolworth, Lucy Lanfear, and Mariah Whitford. Okay, Mary Woolworth. Uh, by the way, she's associated uh, with what we, most of us here remember as the gallery on Main Street. She lived there for a while. Mary Woolworth, born in 1823. This is not Mary, but it could have been. This is somebody of the same period, probably dressed very much the same way as Mary. And here's an ad from a Rochester newspaper showing that kind of goods was available. A farmer's daughter and a farmer's wife, she was, as the writer of her 1910 obituary pointed out, not only an expert spinner and weaver, but had learned to do tailoring. That a woman. Furthermore, worth remarking upon, she died in the woolen blankets of her own production. In 1910, that's a big deal. At face value, this report gives faster spin to the weaving pioneer housewife stereotype. But Mary undoubtedly learned to weave from her mother, who may have been employed in or for a Rhode Island weaving mill before her marriage. But while Mary was growing up, far from such employment opportunities, home weaving was losing ground as a money maker. Apparently, her parents wanted to equip Mary to be able to generate income if necessary. They gave her the choice of going to school to fit herself for teaching or learning a trade. She chose tailoring, at which she became expert. So it was that she was trained as a tailoress or advanced seamstress, able to make and maintain basic menswear like trousers as well as women's clothing. That was a specialty. She was not a mere seamstress. In 1846, she married John, a nearby farmer, and the story goes that he built her a loom. John's spinster sister, Margaret, who was a middle sibling, she wasn't one of the eldest of the big family, she was still living at home, the only woman at home, keeping house for him and his younger brothers. It would appear that Mary found it advisable to keep out of Margaret's way while still being productive, weaving. Why was Margaret possessive because if Margaret left that house she was going to be in a dark corner somewhere she had no hope of marrying presumably and this was her only hope of agency while she was still running that household and I would imagine she wouldn't have yielded her ground very readily to this young thing that just married her brother when the brothers finally married the younger ones Margaret went to live with one and Mary could take uncontested control of down John's household now as his wife no more time for weaving they had two kids. She was listed in the 1860 census as tailoress, not weaver. Darn it. Go back. She was listed as tailoress, not weaver. She was a busy woman with a fairly rare skill that made her a more, more valuable as a tailoress than a weaver. Now, here's Lucy Lanfear, born in 1828. Again, this isn't Lucy, but it could have been for the same reasons. She had, she made, wrote a sort of combination diary and memoir that I stumbled on at an antique shop. It covered the dates from 1841 to 51, and is pretty astounding. Her first entry had to do with what she did typically in a day at school. She was the daughter of Samuel Lanfear, a tailor who migrated from Rhode Island to Alfred in 1819, and he cleared his land with tailor's shears, his son said. One day of cutting out clothes paid for three days of someone else's land clearing labor. And if he's just cutting out clothes, it's because the lady of the house could put them together. They might not look great, but she could sew them together. But cutting was a whole other deal, and that's where the tailor's expertise was valued. Here they are in their elder age, and they're not wearing homespun. My principal occupation, Lucy writes, during the spring months was spinning tow, which is the rough short fibers from flax after it's been hackled and prepared, basically. She finished about the middle of May. 
What were they thinking? By the 1840s, very few families were growing flax, let alone spinning and weaving it. Why? Because the cotton threads produced by the cotton mills had produced gazillion miles. It was everywhere. Who needed linen? In fact, um, one Rochester merchant advertises that he sells, among other things, homemade cloths. This gives you a clue what you could do with the cloth you made at home. Um, and here's some book muslin handkerchief and green barrage, it's supposed to be, which is a veiling fabric. And Lucy says to us, she made up some cloth and bags so that on the 22nd of May, Father and Sarah went to Rochester trading and so on. They got me some silk and ribbon for a bonnet, a mull dress, a pocket handkerchief, and an orange and a veil for my share. So she's not wearing the stuff she's spinning. She probably didn't help weave it. She was probably too young. But her older sister and or mother would have done the weaving. And they together made the bags that got traded for the goodies. The Lanfear women were employing a family skill to cooperatively produce simple cloth to be turned into some of the nicer things of life. She couldn't weave a green barege veil, but she could, they could throw together some um, sacking cloth and that would be a good way to get what you wanted. And here's Mariah, and this really is Mariah. I've taken the liberty of coloring it as I see fit. That's from um, Helene Phelan's original book cover. She was Lucy's young, younger cousin. We know about her daily activities because she kept diaries from 1857 to 61, transcribed and published by a local historian in 1976 with the birth of the personal computer, not quite in her hands yet. Now on the left is my beat up copy and I did an update last year for the Baker's Bridge Historical Association in which, because it had finally dawned on me as I read through it, first of all, the average reader isn't going to know what the heck she's talking about, so I have got a running commentary alongside Helene's running commentary so that uh, I'm trying to help you understand what Mariah is doing. She is a weaving fool and um, not, this is by her period, not really necessary and certainly not here. So this is a tip of the iceberg. She was married to a modestly successful farmer, but she was hard at work at her loom until her death in 1861 when just about everyone else who had been weaving had long abandoned theirs. She recorded almost all her activities, including details of her spinning and weaving output. Samuel raised sheep, but like everyone else there, grew no flat flax, and I know this because the agricultural census of the period shows that. Mariah spun wool, llama fur as she called it, it probably was alpaca, and flax that she would have had to purchase. She often felt badly and had problems with her eyesight, yet she was always diligently cleaning, cooking, and all the rest. The Whitworths had no children, but Mariah often was assisted by visiting relatives. Rather than put her feet up, she went to her loom. Her simple counterbalance loom was always ready in an unheated bedroom upstairs. Notice this is not some little dinky thing that you can block the doorway with and you're not standing. She's, she's resting on a little bench behind her. Mariah wove a lot of rag carpeting and mentions carpeting in her home, including the kitchen, where even then it was considered inadvisable. She wove 24 rags of, uh, yards of rag carpeting and then later another 26 yards on a purchased cotton warp. And then she sold another length of, sold another length of carpet. And this was simple stuff to do. It was like learning to strum a few chords on a guitar. Anyone can do that, but not everyone is Segovia. Here's flannel. She wove 27 yards of all wool flannel and sold 10 yards of it. Then she wove 6 yards of a narrow warp for undershirts and then 36 yards of linsey or flannel. Half of it was for a relative. They made a deal. The red piece in here belongs to the Baker's Bridge Historical Association. The warp is cotton. The weft, the crosswise part, is red wool and that would be called linsey. It was good for a cheap lining or for petticoats and so forth or lightweight blankets. Now, she wove 12 yards of llama fur for two coats. This weave structure here, if you can tell, is, is more sophisticated. You can see a twill or diagonal line there. And without going into, you've got to read the book if you want to know about it, because I explained it better there. But that took some, some finagling to do it that way, but it was a cheaper way of making a wool fabric. So all, most of the wool was on the surface, 
and less on the undersurface. So it was like a lightweight wool. And this piece was used to make a tailcoat of about 1830 that was worn in New Hampshire. Um, and I, this is one I'm convinced was a home product. And it was tailored, it had a velvet collar, but it had to have hems, which, which good quality wool didn't, because you could just cut it and they wouldn't fray. So good quality coats did not have hems. This had to be hemmed. So it was a little bit cruder looking, but it had fancy sporting buttons on it, and the, as I say, the velvet collar. So this <coughs> was intended to be kind of um, nice. But Mariah's probably was more like this, a style coming into popularity at that time, a lounge coat or a sack coat that didn't have to fit closely, as you can see, it was very loose, and it would have made a good thing to wear when you're out doing farm chores, especially because llama fur would have been very um, warm, whether it was llama or alpaca. Um, they're hard to spin. She probably liked doing it because she was ornery and was by golly going to make that, that alpaca fur spin, and certainly it isn't going to tailor well. So. Um, that's why I think it probably was a good practical knock-around kind of coat. Can't prove it. And she wove seven yards of diaper, which means a cloth that has floats that form a kind of lozenge or diamond pattern one way or another. She used machine spun cotton and she made two towels and a tablecloth. That's where we get our term diaper from that we think of with uh, infant use because the floats made the fabric more absorbent. She wove another 27 yards on a cotton warp. Six yards of it was woven off with a toe weft and the rest with linen for hand and table use. On the left is a toe cloth towel. It's brown, it's rough. Um, on the right is a bleached linen tablecloth. Um, the linen or line fiber was long and silky. The toe cloth was itchy and scratchy. That's what they put on the slaves. Here's a modern loom with a modern linen warp on it. So you get some idea of how fine that can be. That takes a long time to, to prepare, prepare the loom that way. And this little scrap is in the collection of Baker's Bridge too, reportedly uh, woven there on the farm where Lyle and Thelma Pometer live. One past tense, of course. 22 yards of linen warp she put up. She had prepared it from flax, and she wove, started weaving it with tow, which is I cannot understand why she would go to the trouble of pre preparing a flax warp and then weaving it with tow because that's like putting gold on the warp and rope on the weft. I don't know why she did that, but there may have been a good reason. She did this in 1861. What was she thinking? Along her, her way, Mariah purchased or traded for these claws, all kinds of claws. She had access to it. I don't know exactly how much was available in Alfred and how much they had to go to, to uh, Rochester for or some other town like Bath, but uh, it was available. These are representative examples. And the title, White Vest for Samuel, um, this is one of Samuel's white vests, but it seems to, by its style, post-date Mariah's period. But that's Marseille cloth, and she also mentions buying Marseille. That is to say, it's got a, a so almost sculptural or relief quality. The fabric is the sort that doesn't need ironing and it's pretty tough. It's a good choice for waistcoats or vests and ladies had what would amount to sportswear. That is a skirt with a jacket you could wear to the seashore. You're still looking like you're in a tent wearing it, but um, that was sportswear. Mariah liked carpets throughout her house, a new ideal of the day, and she was content to make her own. But the main thing seems to be she loved threads and challenges. There was no other reason to put a long monster linen warp on her loom in 1861. They were all well off, so why did they weave? Mary, for practical political expedience, Lucy, for personal mad money, and Mariah, for thrifty comfort and thread love. They did not have to wear homespun. Here's another little piece that was saved by the family, woven supposedly around 1780, toweling or a tablecloth type of fabric. Um, it wasn't really meant when the women did weave, it wasn't necessarily making something to wear. It was a utilitarian fabric of some kind, and the ones who were overachievers would learn the, the more complicated weave structures, but most of them are weaving the simple flannel and stuff. They could have access to whatever they wanted, for the most part, even if you're way off on the Mississippi River. It all depended on having the skill, having the equipment, space, and time, having the inclination, and wanting the payoff badly enough to do all that work. 
This gingham dress of hand-spun, hand-woven linen cost more, in a sense, than this factory cotton gingham because it was more labor-intensive by far. Anyone who was um, involved in making a linen dress was probably trying, either very desperate or trying to make, prove a point. It just simply wasn't cost-effective. And certainly, if you had access to a print, it was even less, made, made even less sense. So if you could obtain store cloth, as most could, the choice was what we now call a no-brainer. In a busy world, there was little reason to go to all that trouble if there was the least chance of making a good trade or purchase at the nearest store or from the next peddler. Thank you.